applause for everybody who's participated in service thus far. I mean, first off, welcoming us on in was the uh, Collymores with the rousing welcome right there. And man, the coast and Kira, Claudia said it at the beginning of service, they just look like they should be on the cover of a magazine right there. The cover of GQ, if you will, uh, they, they just look sharp right there. And uh, what an awesome welcome. Brandon, with that prayer, we had to get on our knees for that. And then a Jasmine, thank you so much, sis, for uh, the incredible communion, for just being so vulnerable and uh, bringing us to the foot of the cross and really making us understand how, how blessed we are and how grateful we can be for forgiveness and how sad it is that many people, many people die without the forgiveness of Jesus in their lives. And yet we have that. And it should be what motivates us. It should be what moves us every single day. And uh, so thank you so much. Love you a lot, Jazz. And uh, thank you once again. And then Angel with the uh, top five reasons for contribution. That might be one of my top five contributions I've ever heard right there. And uh, I thought that was creative, was awesome, was convicting, and was, uh, you know, very educational in that way right there. And so I can't wait to see... Uh, what God does in Angel's lives. Angel is an incredible brother. He's still single, ladies. He's still single, sisters, all right? So, so Angel is still a single brother, amen. But uh, he, he gives to the Lord. I know God's going to bless him with an incredible girlfriend sometime here in the future. And then I, what, was, what I really liked as well was uh, us being able to sing Garrett, sing that song right there. I mean, that was awesome. And uh, I, one of the things I'm most looking forward to when we all come back together is the singing. I can't wait to sing with you guys again. Oh my gosh. I mean, these songs are awesome, but I'm getting, uh, honestly, I'm like, these songs are, I'm getting sick of these songs right here. I want to hear DaCosta. I want to hear Garrett. I want to hear Gavin. I want to be able to clap along together. I want to be able to sing with everybody. And uh, I just can't wait until we're all back together. Uh, again, worshiping God together as family. Okay, so guys, excited to be here this morning. Now it's time for the lesson. And so what we've been doing in the church, it was awesome. We just finished our Haggai, Zechariah, and Nehemiah series, and it was cool to really learn how they built up the temple and the walls once again, and, and in the same way, what that took and what it's going to take for us to build up the church in this generation. And now we were going to move on into our Luke series, but I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, well, what do we need? And I think if we did Luke, Luke is just so big of a book. There's so much there. It wouldn't really do it justice to do a four-part series. So instead, we're going to do the book of Mark. And so we're going to do a Mark series. Now, I was also thinking because worldwide right now in the church, we're having our September to Remember campaign. And uh, this is very special, guys. I, I, this is the first time I've ever heard of a movement campaign. The first time I've ever heard one. And so we only get one September a year, and we only get one September of 2020 for the rest of our lives. And so today we're going to take a little detour in the lesson, and we're going to start the book of Mark next week. Amen, guys? And today we're going to talk about one thing, and the title of the lesson this morning is A September to Remember. A September to Remember. And uh, this is a lesson that I did at staff this last Tuesday, and I just thought it's very fitting for the whole church. And you might be thinking, oh, man, bro, staff, that's for like the leaders. Why would you preach that for Sunday service? Well, guys, all of us on here are leaders, and all of us on here need to hear this lesson so that we can have the direction going forward to not just say we're going to have a September to remember, but actually have a September to remember. Amen, guys? And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. You know, it's been awesome. In the first 13 days of the month of September, God has done so much worldwide. He's done so much. Countless baptisms and actually three new churches added to the movement in this month alone. You've got the Thomasville and Tallahassee Church right there, also known as the TNT Church Planning, because that church is just going to be dynamite right there. Then the Vancouver Canada Church got planted right there and the K-City Haiti, which is our 11th church in Haiti. And that's just in the first 13 days. What is God going to do throughout the rest of the month? Guys, it's going to be incredible to see. Now, go ahead and raise your hand if you want to have a September to remember. Go ahead and raise your hands. I know Angel wants a September to remember. 
I know the Collymore's. I know the brother's household. I know Brandy does. She doesn't even have her camera on, but her thumbs up right there, you know? I know Gavin does. Guys, we all want a September to remember. So what is it going to take for this to happen? I believe two things, two basics. Go to Acts chapter 6, and we're going to see what did the first century church do in order to have a memorable moment right here. Amen? Okay, real quick, some feedback. The lighting like this or like this? Not like this? Other way? Like this? The other way, bro. The other way. Like this? Yeah, it's great. All right. Fire it up. Perfect. Need you guys in my life for that sound advice right there. Okay. Acts chapter 6, and uh, we'll be in verse 1. Let me know when you guys get there. A September to remember. Amen. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. And it says, in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the words. This proposal pleased the whole group. Verse seven. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So right here, it says when the number of disciples was increasing, and it's awesome that Amittai and Cameron just got baptized last week, guys. Isn't that awesome right there? And then, of course, when you have some increase in number right there, when you have a lot of additions, what comes with that? For sure, some shenanigans. And when we're growing in that way, shenanigans are going to follow. And what was going on in the church right here is that there wasn't enough food or the food wasn't being distributed, all, you know, the right way. And so these widows were being overlooked. Well, the apostles are like, okay, well, this is not good. We've got to make sure that these widows get their food. But what should we do? We can't be focused on that. No, we are going to delegate wisely. We're going to put this down to seven spiritual brothers right there. And what are we going to do? We're going to focus on two things, prayer and the ministry of the word. And because they focused on these things, what was the result? In verse seven, instead of increasing, they go to increasing rapidly. And guys, I don't know about you, but I want all of our ministries not just to increase, but to increase rapidly i know in september september to remember we don't just want to increase we want to increase rapidly you got to think about this the apostles busy guys and yet the two things that they focused on that they were devoted to was prayer and ministry of the word and in the same way this is what we need to do as well if we want to have a september to remember we need to be devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word and those are my two points this morning the first point is prayer. You know, there are well over 650 accounts in the Bible where people pray to God. And these are only the specific accounts where they said, hey, they, we, they prayed or they lifted up their voices to God. So actually, there are a lot more accounts where people prayed in the Bible. And in the book of Acts alone, there are over 25 times where prayer is mentioned. This is almost in every chapter of the book of Acts right there. You got to ask yourself, why was the first century church so focused on prayer? Why were the apostles so focused? Why did they think, hey, we need to, to devote ourselves to this? Because Jesus was so focused on prayer. You know, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, it says that Jesus offered up prayers during the days of his life, prayers and petitions. It doesn't just say, hey, he did this during the, a day of his life, but during the days. Jesus was always praying. And so the apostles in the first century church, they were devoted to prayer because Jesus was devoted to prayer. They were focused on prayer because Jesus was focused you can do that. You can watch on him. prayer. Right yeah, he's going to have to send it. Right Got to mute mama right there. But Jesus was focused on prayer. Amen. And it's incredible. The Bible specifically records 25 of Jesus's prayers and even more parables. And we're going to go to one of my favorites this morning in Luke chapter 18. We've got to be devoted on Joey. We've got to be devoted 
to prayer. What does this look like? Luke chapter 18. And in Luke 18, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me. I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep on putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus is talking to his guys. And he says, hey, I need to tell you guys a parable to show you that you should always pray and never give up. What is that going to be like? You know, prayer is like a widow and an unjust judge. And I'm sure the guys are thinking like, what the heck? How does this relate in any way right here? He says, you know, it's just like if a widow was going to an unjust judge and begging him every single day and night to grant her justice. And this is very interesting because he relates God to the judge and us to the widow. And you got to think, the judge and God are very different. The, the judge is an unjust judge, but God is just. He loves us very much. And in fact, he wants to give us what we pray for. And yet just to prove the point, this widow was going to an unjust judge, somebody who was in power, but was not just, who didn't care about people and all these things and did not fear God. But it's so powerful because the focus is really not on the judge, but on the widow and on us. And how did the widow come to the judge? Every day, every night, begging the judge, hey, you've got to grant me uh, justice against my adversary. And finally, he has enough. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm getting so annoyed at this lady right here. I'm getting so bugged here. Just so you don't eventually come and attack me here. Here's what you want. Here's justice. Get out of here. We're good. And she gets what she wants right there. And yet, this is how Jesus tells us that we need to pray, in the same way as this widow. You know, I can totally relate to this. I've got a beautiful nephew, a young boy named Rowan. And let me tell you something. I love Rowan to death. I love that awesome, incredible. They came over to California. I still have his footprints right over here in my office. He's, he's stood on, you know, a little dirty area. There's still footprints right there. I love Rowan. But let me tell you something, he can get on my nerves sometimes. I, I, man, he will ask me for stuff every time I'm with him and he will just ask and ask and ask and ask. Oh my gosh, I'm like, man, here, eventually just take your cars, take your toys, get some ice cream, all this stuff, like quit bothering me. You know what I mean? And it's just like, man, I've got to give him what he wants because he keeps on begging. But in the same way, guys, I want to bug God. I want to bug God. Do you want to bug God? I want to bug God by how much I pray to him, by how much I speak to him, by how much I come to him, by how much I ask of him. I want to get on God's nerves by how much I pray. And I want to ask God for everything. Why? He asked me for everything. He asked me for everything. I want to ask God for everything. You know, maybe you don't want to ask God for everything this morning because he can't still ask you for everything. And we've got to be asking God for everything because he asked us for everything. Maybe you're sitting here just like, you know what? I just don't beg anybody like that. That's just not part of my life. I just don't want to, you know, make somebody uncomfortable in that way. I don't want to be annoying. And yet Jesus is actually telling us to pray like that. He says, you don't understand. You've got to always pray and never give up. Always pray and never give up. He will answer those who cry out to him day and night. This needs to describe our prayer life, that we are crying out to God day and night. How are we going to have a September to remember? By crying out to God like this, by praying the way that Jesus tells us to pray, by going to God consistently with persistence, not just getting discouraged if we get one no, not just getting discouraged if it doesn't happen in a day, but consistently going to God every single day. 
I want to ask God for everything. But it says something very specific right here. In the last part, it says, but will he find faith on the earth? Why would Jesus say that relating to prayer? Will he find faith on the earth? You know, our prayer life is directly proportional to how much faith that we have. Why was Jesus always praying? Because he knew that God was going to do it for him, that he was going to answer him. Why was the widow constantly going to the judge? Because she knew she had faith that she was going to get what she was asking for. Why was he always praying? Because he had faith that God was going to do this. If there's a lack of prayer in our lives, it's not an issue of scheduling. It's not an issue of being busy. It's not an issue of anything else. The only issue is it's an issue of faith. If somebody's not praying that much, it just shows that there's a lack of faith in their life because they don't really believe that their prayers are going up to God or they don't really believe that their prayers are going to be answered. And yet for us, we need to have this faith that's going to lead us to prayer and go to God to cry out to him day and night. You know, but what is faith? Ask yourself, what is faith? Just think about it. What is it? You know, Hebrews 11, 1, it says confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. Sure, absolutely. But what is faith? What does this look like? How, how does this, what, how do we think about this? Faith is not believing that God can do something. Faith is not just believing that God can do something. It's believing that he will do something. Faith is not just believing that God can give us a September to remember. Faith is knowing that he will give us a September to remember. Faith is not just believing that God can use you to change people's lives. It's not believing that he can. It's knowing that he will use you. Faith is knowing that God will do these things. And when we have this faith, it just changes up our prayer life a little bit. You know what I mean? I want to do a little exercise right here. I'm not talking about the weights. I know Gavin just got excited right there. Amen. I want to do a little exercise. And for the next five seconds, I'm going to raise up my, my hand and count to five. For the next five seconds, remove every doubt you have. Remove, remove every doubt, take away all the doubts, all the negative thoughts, all of that thing, and believe for the next five seconds that God will answer your prayers this month. Okay, here we go. It's all the doubts, don't let them creep back in. Here we go. Five seconds. That's it. All right. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, okay. There we go. Only five seconds. Okay, now for the next five seconds, I want you guys to believe with all of your heart. Let all the doubt get out. Let all the negative thoughts, all that stuff, that you will be fruitful this month. Take all the doubts out. Take all the doubts. You know, this is only five seconds. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five seconds over. We're good. How was that? It's pretty good, right? Felt pretty good, man. No doubts in there. No negative thoughts. We believe that we will be fruitful. All these things. We believe that God will answer these prayers. But guys, if we can do that for five seconds, we can do that for a minute. If we can do that for a minute, we can do that for an hour. If we can do that for an hour, we can do that for days. But that's what faith is. That to know that God will do these things. You know, in Luke 11, it's amazing the guys come to Jesus and they ask him to teach them to pray. You know, if Jesus was here today, what would you ask him for? What would you ask Jesus to teach you how to do? Just think about that. If you were in the same room as Jesus, what would you ask him how to do this morning? Maybe walk on water. That'd be awesome. Jesus, teach me how to walk on water. You know, maybe, maybe catch a lot of fish. Maybe be able to multiply our food. Brother's household fired up right there. Never going, never going grocery shopping again. We're good. You know, maybe be able to heal people, that stuff. What would, you, what would you ask Jesus to teach you to do? And yet, what is it that the apostles taught, asked him to, to teach them? They said, hey, we're with Jesus. We could ask him to teach us anything. But the thing I want to know how to do like Jesus is how to pray like Jesus. Why? Because when Jesus prays, man, miracles happen. Things happen. Things get shaken up. And they wanted to know how to pray just like Jesus. We can't walk on water or do any of these other things, but we can pray like Jesus. We can pray the way that Jesus wants us to pray. We can imitate him in prayer. And that's pretty powerful right there. 
You know, God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. God can do more in a moment than we can do in, in, in our whole life. And I think sometimes we can pray in hope, but not pray in faith. That we pray, God, I hope that this will happen. Or God, please allow this to happen. Instead of faith, where it's like, God, thank you for letting this happen. Even in Mark 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Jesus says, hey, don't pray saying, hey, God, I hope that I'll get this. Or please, I hope that you'll give this to me. He says, no, pray that you already have received it. Saying, God, thank you for giving this to me. Already. Thank you for letting us have a September to remember. Thank you for letting us be fruitful. Thank you for blessing us in incredible ways. Thank you. We've already received it. And that's the prayer of faith. That's the prayer of faith. You know, there's a quote. It says, he who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. You want miracles in your life? You got to go to the one who can, who can work the miracles. He who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. You know, guys, I just want to be open. Man, I preached this at staff last Tuesday. And uh, go, coming into that lesson, this did not describe my life. In no way. I, I came in and I was preaching to myself because there had just been such a lack of prayer in my life. Like, and I, you know, when you don't pray, you just feel dehydrated. As Ricky said this last Friday night, when you don't pray, you just feel like quenched spiritually. And uh, there was just such a lack of prayer. And I, I was like, you know what? I'm making the decision to repent. And going from Tuesday to today, what a world's difference, guys. Oh my gosh. I feel so much better, so much more confident, more faithful, stronger spiritually. Why? Because I've just increased my prayer life. Nothing that I've done except for that. But I want to call all of us. If you need to repent this morning, if you need to change up your prayer life, then do that. Having an explosive, fruitful, explosively fruitful September to remember starts with us going to the one who can make it that way, going to God in prayer. And also, what miracle do you want to come back and in the future and look back and say, hey, that happened in September? Pray for that. I want to challenge all of us. One, make a prayer list. Make a prayer list. What are you praying for? Make a prayer list. And two, set an amount of time that you want to pray for each day for the rest of the month of September. How much time do you want to pray for each day? Make, make, set that time. Mine is going to be two hours a day. I'm going to pray for two hours every day since last Tuesday to the end of September. And I want to call all of the paid staff, all of the interns, and all of the armor bearers and shield mains to join with me in that and to pray for two hours a day. And you may be like, man, that's pretty challenging. Yeah, this is going to challenge us. This is good. But I want to call all of them to pray for two hours a day. But everybody else, pick amount of time that you want to pray for for the rest of September. Amen. Point number two, the ministry of the word. The ministry of the word. You know, our incredible brother to Costa preached an awesome leaders meeting this past Sunday. And, uh, you know, to is, is becoming a powerful preacher. He's becoming a powerful preacher. I know Kier is like, that's right. That's my husband right there. He's becoming a powerful preacher and he's becoming a powerful minister as well. And uh, he preached on the solution, which is the word of God. And I thought it was so funny because the word of God is a solution to any problem, to any shenanigans, to anything going on in, in our lives. The word of God is a solution. And you know, the word of God is the most powerful thing on the earth. And it's the only thing that is perfect on the earth. Not even the church is perfect. Why? Because it's got us in it. A bunch of sinners. But the word of God is flawless. It's perfect. Think about that the next time you have a quiet time. In John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In Psalms 33, verse 6, it says, by the word, the heavens were made, their star host by the breath of his mouth. In Genesis 1, it says that God spoke the world into existence. If the word of God has done all of this, if the word of God has done all of these incredible things, what can it do in our lives? If it made the universe, the starry host, all that, what can it do in our lives? What can it do in the lives of our families? What can it do in our ministries? Miracles. And in the same way that the apostles were devoted to that, we have to be devoted as well. In Romans chapter 1, 
chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10, it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. What a powerful passage. It says, The Bible, the word of God, will never return empty. You know, us in California, we know exactly what it's like to be in a drought. I mean, if you've lived in California for any amount of time, you know what it's like to be in a drought. And it's funny, it's not funny, but when you drive through the mountains and there's a drought, you look up at the mountains, you look up at the hills, and they look dusty. They look dried up, they look parched, there's nothing going on there. And yet what's amazing is that when you drive through them and there's been some rain that's happened, to go through the mountains, to go through the hills, and what do you see? Life, flourishing, greenery, shrubs, all these things, there's life. The question is, how do you feel this morning? Do you feel like you're flourishing? Do you feel refreshed? Do you just feel fired up? Or maybe you feel a little parched this morning. Maybe you feel a little crusty. Maybe you feel like, man, you just have, you're going through a drought right there. What needs to change? You gotta get in the word of God. You got to let this life come in right there. The word of God can change anything and anybody. I remember, you know, you guys know these stories well. None of us wants to be crusty in here, amen. You guys know these stories well. But two guys that I've studied the Bible with in particular, my buddy RJ and my buddy Caden. The word of God can change anybody. The first time I met RJ, he was melted into a couch because he was so high. The first time I met Caden, he was pushing people down on a basketball court and cursing them out. And yet getting the word of God in there and to see the change that has happened in these two guys' lives. They got baptized as disciples. And now RJ's in the full-time ministry and getting, getting married in October. That's amazing. How did it happen? The word of God. The word of God. You know, we've got to get the word into people. The ministry of the word is studying the Bible with people. It's having our quiet times. It's having D times. It's preaching. It's getting the word out there so that it can do the heavy lifting. You know, the, th the thing that was challenging for the apostles is that they had too busy of a schedule to be devoted to this. What's it tell, what's it tell all to see if you need to delegate or if your, your schedule's too busy? If you don't have any Bible studies or if you don't have any time for Bible studies, your, your schedule is too packed. Your schedule is just too packed. In the same way that the apostles did, you have to delegate some things. You got to free yourself up so you can be devoted to the ministry of the word. You know, I want to challenge all of us. Go over your schedule. Go over your schedule. And everything that, you, that is not absolutely necessary for you to do for the rest of the month, delegate or free yourself of it. But I really want to challenge us, free ourselves up so we can be busy for the Lord for the rest of the month. Free yourself up so you can be busy for the Lord for the rest of the month. And if you're visiting, do a study with the person who brought you out. Free yourself up as well. But we need to delegate. We need to free ourselves up so we can be devoted to these two things right here, guys. <clears throat> Prayer and ministry of the word. As we fight for September to remember, what is it going to take? It's going to be challenging, guys. It's going to push us. It's going to, it's going to really push us beyond our limits. To pray for that long, to free ourselves up in that way, that's going to be tough. But if we want a September to remember, we're going to have to do memorable things. You're going to have to look back at September. Man, that's the time that I prayed the most in my life. Man, that's the time I was in the most studies I've ever been in. That's the time that God had so many miracles. And it was hard, but it was so worth it. It was so worth it. As we look back at the month of September, what is it that you're going to want to remember? Many things are happening right now. The fires in California and the, the Pacific Northwest, all these things going on. What are you going to want to remember in the month of September? Maybe this is the month that God changes your life. Maybe this is the month that you actually get a real relationship with God. Maybe you've been hurting lately. Maybe there's been things going on. Maybe you're studying the Bible and there's just these challenges. This is the month. 
that you could get changed. Maybe this is a month that you baptize the next evangelist or women's ministry leader. Maybe this is a month you start dating. Who knows? But looking back on, on the year and looking back at September, what is it that we're going to want to remember? God doing incredible miracles. Amen. So guys, going forward, we got to be devoted for the rest of the month to prayer and the ministry word so we can see God do amazing things and actually have a September to remember. I love you guys. And to God be all the glory. Woo!